Today I will talk about bicycle facilities. Over the last few years, many new innovative bicycle facilities have been installed throughout the country. Engineers and planners use the term bicycle facility to refer to any infrastructure, paint markings, or signage that is designated for bicycle use. We can group these as segment facilities, these as parking facilities, and these as intersection facilities. Today I'm going to talk about segment facilities. Many of the new innovations are on segments such as sharrows, cycle tracks, protected bike lane, one earth, rail trail, and many more. Some of these names are redundant, some imply subtle differences. It can be complicated keeping track because sometimes different cities use conflicting names. The point of this presentation is to organize the terminology. Let's start with some history. In the 1800s, cyclists dominated the roadways. They led the effort to establish paved roadways virtually everywhere. This era is known as the Good Roads Movement. In the 1920s, the automobile took over, and for the next 40 years, the bicycle was largely forgotten. In the 1960s, there was a renaissance for the bicycle. This photo shows a celebration for a new bicycle facility. And this photo shows what is considered the first bicycle facility in the United States. It was installed in Davis, California in 1967. California was experimenting with various types of bicycle facilities. It was necessary for engineers and planners to have guidebooks for installing these different facilities. This is an excerpt from a guidebook published in 1972. It defined four types of bicycle facilities. The facilities would be installed based on vehicle speed and vehicle volume. For example, if a roadway has 4,000 vehicles per day and a speed limit of 25 miles per hour, then the recommendation was an on-street lane. However, if the daily volume is less than 2,000 vehicles per day, then the road would be designated for mixed cycling, meaning no separation would be provided. Note the facility considered the first from 1967 was a protected lane. The word protection is used because the cyclist is separated from moving traffic by parked cars and a concrete divide. Most of the early guidebooks in California emphasized separate paths and protected lanes everywhere. The goal was to have a separate bikeway network like is found in many cities in Europe. This all changed in the 1970s with what is known as the vehicular cycling revolt. The revolt was led primarily by a man named John Forrester who wanted to fight for his right to cycle everywhere. His group felt that cyclists had a legitimate place on all roads and they did not want to give it up. They felt that protected lanes and separate paths were pushing cyclists off of the roadways. They felt that expensive bicycle paths could never be provided throughout the city. They did not think the United States would ever be able to catch up to Europe with bicycle paths going everywhere. They fought to remove protected lanes and separate paths from the guidebooks. They essentially killed this chart and it was not to be seen again for the next 50 years. They focused on mixed traffic and felt that with proper education everyone could be comfortable cycling with cars. Because of their revolt, these became America's bicycle facilities. There have been various books written about the devastating impact of vehicular cycling. For the next 50 years, the conventional bike lane and mixed cycling dominated the guidebooks used by engineers and planners. This all changed in 2010 when New York City removed the lane of traffic and replaced it with a new bicycle facility. This marked the second bicycle renaissance. Soon two new guidebooks were published, the first by NACDO, the National Association of City Transportation Officials, and the other was F by FHWA, the Federal Highway Administration. This new bicycle facility began to pop up all over the country. The question remained what to call this new type of bicycle facility. The NACTO guidebook used the term cycle track. This was borrowed from the British who were translating the Dutch word fietspad. In British English, fiets means cycle and pod means track. However, in American English, a better translation would be a bicycle path. If you were to show an American a Dutch fietspad, and ask them what to call it, they would probably call it a bicycle path. FHWA chose to use the term separated bike lane. This highlights that in America, this facility is often a retrofit that is squeezed into an existing roadway. In many American cities, there's not enough space for a Dutch feet spot. 
Furthermore, it is possible that FHWA did not use the term protected to avoid conveying safety protection. The organization People for Bikes conducted a study to identify the best name. They surveyed cyclists, non-cyclists, academics, and practitioners. They concluded that the best term is protected bike lane. Their study, which is available on their webpage, argues that having specific terminology and definitions assures that engineers and planners install facilities that meet a certain standard. They report that there are now protected bike lanes in nearly every state, shown in blue and totaling nearly 400 miles. Their organization notes that the term protected bike lane can be modified as needed, such as painted protected bike lane, one-way or two-way protected bike lane, or contraflow protected bike lane. By the way, in some circumstances, contraflow bicycle facilities have been shown to be safer because they provide better eye contact between cyclist and driver, similar to why many joggers prefer to run against traffic. Protected bike lanes are not the only new facility cropping up. All over the United States, there have been new bicycle facilities with names like Bike Boulevard, Neighborhood Greenway, Sharrows, and Traffic Calming. Terminology and classification ensure that engineers and planners are installing facilities that meet a certain standard. Today, these four classes can be defined. Class one is the off-street path class. Class two is the protected bike lane class. Class three is the bike lane class and class four is the bicycle street class. Bicycle street is a term used commonly in Europe. State DOTs or communities can define minimum requirements for each class. Then within the broad umbrella of this class system, different and innovative facility types with varying qualities and specifications can be designed, tested, and implemented. This flow chart can be used to determine the correct classification for a facility. The first question is, are bicycles permitted? If the answer is no, then this is a prohibited roadway. Thanks to the vehicular cycling revolt in the 1970s, there are not many roadways in the United States that prohibit bicycling. In fact, even on freeways, bicycling is usually allowed. In the U.S., the prohibited roads are private or have narrow bridges. The next question asks, is there any signage or paint markings designating bicycle travel? If the answer is no, then this is simply a roadway without any formal bicycle facility. It is important to specifically recognize this class of roadway to make sure it is not confused with a true class 4 facility. Unfortunately, some communities have incorrectly stated that certain roads with low vehicle volumes and low vehicle speeds constitute a bicycle facility. However, a bicycle facility must have some on-location indication, such as signage or paint markings. The next question asks, are bicycles separated from vehicle traffic? If the answer is no, then this is a class four facility. If there is separation, then the next question asks if the separation is vertical. If not, then this is a bike lane class, is the bike lane class. The, the distinction between class three and class two is if there is vertical separation. If the separation is vertical, then it is the protected bike lane class. The distinction for class one is that the facility deviates from the roadway. This flow chart should be able to classify most bicycle facilities, and in fact, nearly every roadway in the United States. A few gray areas could arise if the vertical separation is questionable or if the deviation from the roadway is only for a short distance, but for the most part, this flow chart should suffice to classify existing facilities. Meanwhile, this chart can be used to help proscribe new facilities. It is a throwback to the chart published in 1972. Over the last 50 years, many countries around the world have used charts like this. And recently, charts like this have been once again adopted by state DOTs and local communities. These charts provide a starting point to determine the best facility. The Bicycle Street Class, Class 4, covers low speeds and low vehicle volumes. This is the Mixed Cycling Class. It might include Sharrows, Bike Boulevards, Neighborhood Greenways, Warnerfs, or even roadways that have nothing but bike route signage. Interestingly, research has shown that for low vehicle speeds and low vehicle volumes, 
it can be safer to allow mixed cycling. The reason being that drivers tend to pass cyclists with more space compared to if the driver thinks the bicyclist is safely separated inside their own lane. Class three is all bike lanes that do not have vertical separation, including buffered bike lanes and painted bike lanes. This chart delineates when buffered bike lanes should be considered instead of the conventional bike lane. Class two is for all protected bike lanes. The protection might be substantial, like a row of parked cars, or it might be minor, such as armadillo humps, as shown in this picture. Class one is off-street paths. This might include shared use paths where pedestrians and bicyclists mix, or paths where exclusive bicycle designation. Class one also includes side paths that might run along a roadway, but essentially have their own right of way. It is critical to point out that this chart is only a starting point for deciding the most appropriate facility. There are other factors that should be considered, such as available right-of-way, future plans for the area, and information about the number of cyclists and who they are. For example, a road leading to a school might merit a protected bike lane even if the average daily vehicle volume is low. It is also important to note that this classification does not in indicate a hierarchy of preferences for cyclists. There are many cyclists who would prefer to ride in the road with traffic rather than deviate from their route to find a protected bike lane or pathway.